Roman Fever emerged from Edith Wharton's pen as a poignant offering towards the twilight of a prolific career spanning over five decades. This 1934 short story, akin to her other works, delves into the societal norms of affluent individuals in the United States, probing into the undercurrents of violence these norms condone and possibly encourage. Devoid of superfluous settings and minimal in its unfolding events, the narrative gracefully shifts between the present and the past, sketching the lingering echoes of a love triangle. With the ancient city of Rome as its backdrop, the tale illustrates how the past can weave itself into the present with a potency that often defies anticipation. The narrative centers around four women who have convened for a lunch that has now concluded. The younger pair, Jenny and Barbara, hurry away, their voices fading into the distance as they descend the stairs toward their next escapade. In contrast, their mothers, Alita and Grace, remain on the terrace, basking in the enchanting vista that stretches across the city of Rome. With no immediate plans, the women allow the afternoon to drift by in conversations and reminiscences. Action may be scarce in this tale, as the women engage in dialogue while the darkness envelopes them, but within these conversations, the contours of their lives and their bonds with each other are gently redrawn. Alita Slade and Grace Ansley share a history that spans decades. Once youthful companions in the vibrant streets of Rome, they later found themselves as young mothers living across from each other in the bustling realm of New York City. However, geographical proximity couldn't solidify their friendship, and Alita confesses to feeling a sense of liberation when her husband's financial success facilitated their move to the prestigious Park Avenue. After the customary condolences exchanged over the demise of their respective spouses, the two women lost touch yet again, until a twist of fate brought them, along with their daughters, back to Rome simultaneously. This chance encounter reignites their friendship and guides them to the terrace where the unfolding drama of Roman fever occurs. The narrative viewpoint aligns more closely with Alita's internal musings than with Grace's, as the two women engage in a dialogue that traverses the complex terrain of motherhood and recollections of their youth. In the unfolding scene, Alita takes the reins of the conversation, attempting to steer her friend's focus toward the scenic splendors of Rome. She weaves observations about the city's charm while Grace, almost surreptitiously, brings out her knitting, immersing herself in its rhythm. Alita's introspections take a somber turn as she contemplates her daughter's matrimonial prospects, paling in brilliance compared to Grace's child. A pang of self-reproach nudges Alita to question why she persistently envies her friend. Even though the view before them might rank as the most beautiful, it only seems to magnify Alita's exasperation. She shifts gears, delving into a different avenue of discourse, inquiring whether Grace fears the infamous Roman fever or pneumonia. This leads to memories of Alita's own serious illness years ago, an ailment gossips attributed to a moonrise outing at one of Rome's ancient ruins. As the conversation evolves, Alita prompts Grace to unveil details of this supposedly scandalous escapade. In the midst of this, they pause to recount the tale of Grace's great-aunt Harriet, the one who supposedly dispatched her young sister to the forum after sunset in pursuit of a night-blooming flower. Tragically, the sister fell ill and perished, rendering a cautionary narrative that lingered to dissuade young women from venturing into these alluring yet perilous locales. Much later, the great-aunt confessed the true motive behind her action, that she was driven by jealousy, as she and her sister were both enamored with the same man. It is during this discourse that Alita feels compelled to make a confession of her own. Years in the past, burdened by envy over her friend's happiness and beauty, Alita fabricated a letter supposedly penned by her fiancé, Delphin Slade. The forged letter entreated Grace to meet him at the Colosseum. Alita's motivations for revealing this act remain a mystery to her even now. Though Grace ultimately burned the fabricated letter, the revelation stings deeply, as she had cherished the memory of Delphin's fleeting interest. In her attempt to justify her hurtful act, Alita postulates that Grace's swift marriage thereafter led her to believe that her emotions for Delphin were not as profound. The narrative momentarily intervenes, shifting focus back to the present scene and time. Waitstaff bustle around, preparing the terrace for the impending dinner service. Amidst this activity, a woman searches for a rubber band that once held together the leaves of her well-worn guidebook. Resuming the conversation, the story enters its final phase. Alita interjects, recounting how she sent the letter with a jest in mind, 
envisioning grace lurking around there after dark, slipping out of sight, attuned to every sound, attempting to gain entry. She adds, naturally, I was troubled to hear of your illness afterward. In a quiet yet retaliatory manner, Grace unveils her own share of cruelty. She discloses that the Moonrise Rendezvous was not in vain, she responded to the fabricated letter and Delphin did indeed appear to meet her that very night. Alida is left devastated by this revelation. As she tries to shrug off the turmoil, reminding herself that she had 25 years with Delphin while Grace merely held a forged letter, Grace delivers a succinct, cutting rejoinder that concludes the tale, I had Barbara. I hope you enjoyed this video, leave a like if you did, and be sure to subscribe thank you.